welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time we're going to connect this LCD module to a Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller before testing out some project applications. So let's go and get started. In this video we're going to be using this Raspberry Pi Pico and probably later also a Pico W along with this liquid crystal display. Specifically this box contains a Waveshare LCD 1602 I2C module which means it's got a 16 character by 2 line display and connects to the Pico via an I2C interface. And I'll say a bit more about that in a second. I chose this module because it's one of the cheapest ways of adding a small display to a Pico, although the price varies significantly depending on the retailer. As I'm shooting this video in late May 2023, it's listed for £7.70 at the Pi Hut, £12.99 on Amazon Co UK, and $12.99 on Amazon.com, and I'll provide links in the video description. Note that there are more expensive versions of this display available that have a programmable RGB backlight. This has got a blue backlight, I think. We will find out. And there are also similar LCD I2C products on the market from other manufacturers. And the control code may vary slightly for different hardware, but hopefully this video will communicate some generic principles. So let's open this up. Very, very simple unboxing. It just flicks up and uh, there we are, things are inside. This is the module itself, fairly obviously. We've also got a cable, nice that that's actually supplied. The module itself is in a little anti-static bag, as we can see, and oh, it's resealable. No need for uh, cutting implementations and tools. Straight in, here we go. I've always wanted to play with one of these. Never have done before, so today is the day. And uh, there we are, take it off a little thing, and yes, there is our display. We can take off a little piece of a thing like that. Looks rather good, doesn't it? And uh, on the back of this, there will be a connector. Let's flick it round like that. And if we take a closer look at the connector, we can see there are just four connections involved. VCC and ground for powering the display, which requires an input of between 3.3 and 5 volts. And then the two other connections are for the I2C interface. Also known as I2C, this stands for Inter-Integrated Circuit and is a serial interface which has connections for serial clock or SCL and serial data or SDA. And so there we are. This is our module. Seems to be a very nice little device. It's quite weighty for its size, probably because we've got a glass on the top with a display and also this bezel is metal, so it seems to be a good quality component. And uh, if you're wondering, this can be used with other microcontrollers aside from the Pico. You can use it with Arduino if you want, for example. You can use it with single board computers like a Raspberry Pi or a Jetson Nano. But uh, here we are going to stick with a, a Raspberry Pi Pico, although the general principles we're going to look at will apply to other platforms. Right. For a first test, I've now got the display connected to the Pico with the cable across. There's just four wires, as we can see in this diagram, two for power and two for I squared C. And so I've got a USB lead into the Pico as well. So I'm just going to connect that to the PC. I've got an extension lead off camera here. Oh, it's all moving around. Let me just get that plugged in, make it come back again. I'm going to use a breadboard a bit later on, but uh, oh, there we are. The thing has come to life. There's clearly power in the system, which is good. Stay somewhere on the desk for me. There we are. That'll be okay. And if we now go across to the PC, here we are on the Waveshare page for this particular module. And there's great support here, as you will see if we go down. They tell us all about the board. There is support for working with a Raspberry Pi, for working with a Raspberry Pi Pico, just uh, down here, same wiring diagram as we just saw. And there's a web address here for downloading the firmware, so I'll just uh, highlight that again and uh, do a copy of that, drop that in, and uh, there we are, it'll download the file, and it's going to stick it into my download Pico stuff folder. That is uh, absolutely fine like that. Very small file, I am sure. And if we just go across to that folder, there it is, it's come across down there. We can just open that up and uh, we will extract all. Here is OK. There we go, that's all brought in the files. And I imagine there's files for lots of things, 
their outlook was files for the Pico, Raspberry Pi, Jetson Nano, etc. Here's the files we've got for the Pico. So let's now run up Sony. And because the Pico is connected, if we now go to um, View and to Files, it should show us files both on this PC and also on the Pico. Pico down here, PC at the top, and it's gone to the roughly the right place. There's where we've just downloaded the files. There are hopefully the files. There is where we just saw. Here's three files. Let's just to highlight these and that and that. And if we do an upload to like that, it'll chuck those files across to the Pico. And I imagine the first file here is a driver of some kind. If we just to bring that in, it looks like a driver to me all straight away. There's lots of a driver type stuff, but it's just a Python file. You can edit it yourself if you wanted to. But to test things out, we'll go to the file labeled test.py, which I imagine is a test, uh, which as we can see, imports LCD 1602, the, uh, the driver file. So let's uh, bring back in a shot of the display and we will now execute this code. Very exciting. Oh look, it says WaveShare, hello world. Things are clearly working okay. So if we just to stop that code, it uh, clears the display, which looks like that's what it does down here. Yes, at the bottom it clears the display after it's finished. We could of course change this. Let me just to rapidly change the text. There we go. And if I just save this code and uh, run again, yes, we've got control of the LCD display. And I see we've also got a piece of code down here called a time test. So let's uh, check that out too. I imagine that's something to do with uh, time and, uh, oh look, we've invented a digital clock. This is, this is really cool. I'm very pleased with this little display. It's a nice little device. It's got please do projects written all over me. And so now we will move on to use this in some projects. Right, I've now inserted the Pico in a breadboard and I've mounted everything to a baseboard so the display won't go wandering around again. And I've also added in a push switch, which is connected between the 3.3 volt rail and pin one, as we can see in this diagram, which shows what I've added to our previous wiring. And as we can see, Stanley's now saying hello on the LCD, which I forgot to tell you has got a display area of 64.5 by 16 millimeters. So let's go across to some sample programs I've been experimenting with. And the first one here just highlights the basic principles where to use this module, we first of all import the Python driver and then set the display to be a 16 by two display. And here I'm also importing time so we can use that in our code. And what I'm doing here, first of all, is clearing the screen with the LCD clear command because the screen retains whatever you sent it previously until you, till you clear the screen and write something else. Talking of which, the basic principle here is we set a cursor position and then we print something to that position, which could either be a string as we got here, or it could be a numeric variable. And here in this test, we're then waiting for two seconds and then printing up Stanley's message. So if we run this code like that, it says, this is very exciting. And then Stanley's message appears on the screen. So let's go across to something a little bit more practical. This is a counter example, imports modules again, but also here imports pin so we can use our switch. And specifically here, we're setting up the pin on GP0, which is actually physical pin one. That's why there's a zero here when we're connected to pin one. And we're setting this up as an input with an internal pull down resistor. And if you want to know more about this, I covered this in detail in my video, which was all about using switches and servos and things like that with a Raspberry Pi Pico. After that here, we're setting up a counter. We're setting the counter value initially to be zero and printing it on the screen with the word count is. And then we've got a little loop down here, which while true is always true, so this cycles through forever. And in our second while loop here, switch value will be true when the switch is pressed. So when the switch isn't pressed, everything here is ignored. This keeps cycling through. But when the switch is pressed, it adds one to the counter. It prints the counter on the screen again, because obviously it's changed. And then here, while switch value is true, this will cycle on until we release the switch, in which case we go back on again and continue through. So let's run this code. Very exciting. And we can see on the screen it says count is zero. But if I take the switch and press it, count is one, two, three, 
four. And if I hold down the switch, you see it doesn't do anything until we release it. It's properly debounced and trapped and everything like that. So this is a very effective little counter. And of course, here I'm counting using a switch pressed by a human being, but this could be a contact somewhere. All sorts of things could be counted using this type of system. And I find this very exciting indeed. But you might be thinking, is there anything even more exciting we can do? And there is, because if we go across to our third piece of code, I'm sure some people are asking, does it game? And it does game. I've written for this system the most exciting game probably in the whole world. And it starts off as we did previously, setting things up with the switch. And then we've got a section called Get Game Ready, which prints the instructions on the screen to try and hold down the switch for 10 seconds. We've then got a large loop, which goes on all the way through. And what basically happens here, it waits until the switch is pressed by cycling on through here until the switch is pressed. And then it records a start time using a time.timeNS, which basically records the current time in nanoseconds. The Pico won't know the actual time. It'll know the time since it was turned on, but that's absolutely fine. But after that, it clears the screen and tells us the game is in play. And then after that, it waits until the switch is released. I'm sure you would have guessed that was about to happen. And then after that, it works out the elapsed time, taking the current time minus the start time, reports the actual time that's elapsed, and then gives us some feedback on what it thinks about our performance. So let's run the game. It is, as I said already, very exciting. And it's inviting us to hold down the switch for 10 seconds. So let's just do a simple test initially just to check it's all working. That wasn't 10 seconds. That was three seconds, which was useless. Shall I have a better go? Let's try a counting cups of tea as animators always do. One cup of tea, two cup of tea, three cup of tea, four cup of tea, five cup of tea, six cup of tea, seven cup of tea, eight cup of tea, nine cup of tea, ten cup of tea. Well, there we are. That was 10 seconds. It was perfect. Do you think I can do it again? One cup of tea, two cup of tea, three cup of tea, four cup of tea, five cup of tea, six cup of tea, seven cup of tea, eight cup of tea, nine cup of tea, ten cup of tea. That was eight, it was fair. I should have stayed with the, the first result, shouldn't I? Anyway, the game clearly works. It's very exciting, probably the most popular game in the world in a couple of months' time. But I think we're now going to move on to incorporate the display into another project. Greetings! Here I am back again, and I've now dug out the anemometer that I built in a video a few years ago. And this was initially connected to a Raspberry Pi 3 B+, but it's now connected to our Raspberry Pi Pico and LCD display. And as you can see, this is disconnected from the computer. This is entirely independent. It's got a power bank to power it. And if I turn on the power bank like that, it says measuring wind speed. Let's give it some wind. <sighs> There we are. That was a wind speed of, I managed to achieve 5.03 miles per hour. It basically measures wind speed over a period of, of 10 seconds and it's continuing to do it. So it's now dropped down to a 0.74. It, might, it must have been just finishing on the end of that 10 seconds of the first sort of cycle, if you like. It'll drop down to zero in a second, I imagine, because there'll be no more. Yes, there's no more wind speed going on. Let's uh, give it a bit more wind speed like that. And the way that this works is that inside here, there's a disc on the spindle, and this has a white mark on it, and under the disc is a sensor with an infrared LED. And when light from this hits the white mark, it reflects back to trigger an infrared phototransistor, which in turn allows us to measure rotation and calculate wind speed. A little control board contains the necessary current limiting and pull down resistors, with the wiring to the Pico being, as we can see here in this diagram, and which once again I've added to what we had earlier. To make this work, the code is obviously saved on the Pico. It's saved as main.py, so it auto executes when the, the Pico boots up. But over here on the computer, I've got a copy of the code, just so you can see roughly what's going on. It's pretty similar to what we had previously, at least at the start. It imports the various things required for LCD, and it sets up GP28 to be an input. We don't have to set a pull down resistor because we've got a physical pull down resistor in the circuit for the anemometer. And then down here, we've got various calculations to allow us to calculate the speed of the wind from the rotation 
of the spindle, and then we've got a loop which does just that. It runs for 10 seconds, makes the calculations, and then puts the results onto the LCD display. And if you want to know the detail of how this works, look at my video about creating a Raspberry Pi anemometer, and I'll provide links to all code in the video description. Anyway, having demonstrated how this works sitting on the desk, I think we should now take it outside. You can see there's lots and lots of cable involved so we can get this at the top of a pole. So let's go and do just that. And here we are outside. Let's turn things on like uh, that. And I really must get a rolling stone in at some point to help me deal with all the moss around here. But uh, as we can see, we're measuring the speed of the wind. I've got the sensor up a pole about uh, nine or 10 feet high. It is going around a little bit, not massively, but it is going around. And yes, it's giving us a wind speed, 0.37 miles an hour. This thing is working. There's not a lot of weather here today. It's rather dull, not very windy, it's just a non-weather. But uh, anyway, the key thing is this is working. We've proved a principle. This could of course all be put together into a much smaller unit. And I like the idea it can be battery powered. You could come out, turn this thing on, take a measurement, turn it off again. That would work very well indeed. And it's also, I think, always nice to revisit an older project to add a new component, which here, of course, is our LCD display. So there we are. We've tested out various applications for an LCD module connected to a Raspberry Pi Pico. And I hope it's given you some interesting project ideas. And at the very least, it's given me the opportunity to give my homemade anemometer another whirl. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.